welcome all to this closing session of the final conference of the New Horizon project. Um, we are very happy to have you all here and we are privileged to have with us a number of eminent professionals and scholars who have extensive expertise in theorizing about RI and in doing RI. I will introduce them to you shortly. I want to explain what we hope to achieve with this final session. What we want to do on the basis of their contributions and your input is to look back on the past two weeks of reflecting on RI practice, notably in the light of efforts and uh, results of the New Horizon project, but equally um, and enriched uh, on the basis of many experiences with RI that have been shared during these sessions from other uh, projects and other contexts, and to reflect not for the sake of reflection, but to think about what can we bring from these experiences um, and results in order to further RI in the days to come, in the years to come, in policy, in research and in innovation. Um, and I hope that you all will um, contribute to that and there will be moments in the program for you to um, join in the conversation. What we will do, I first introduce the speakers uh, to you of our round table, um, upon which I will very quickly, with the aid of Shauna Stack, walk you through the upshot of the sessions of the past two weeks, very, very briefly, and absolutely not doing all of the discussions justice, but merely bringing them back to mind. And then I will give the floor to our panelists who will, after their opening address, look into this question of what can we bring from these experiences and what does it take to further RI in the years to come. And again, there will be room for you to join in and eventually I'll give the floor to Eric Kriesler for closing statements of this conference. So let me first introduce our panelists. Perhaps if you would open your cameras, that would be great. We have six panelists here, six people joining in our round table. And the first I want to mention is Martina Schoutner. And Martina is the head of the Center Responsible Research Innovation at the Fraunhofer Institute, as well as the Department on Gender and Diversity in Technology um, in Berlin. And she is a lead, has a leading role in the German and international academic world and its relations with policy and business, and is, among others, a board member of the German the Deutsche Akademie der Wissenschaften, Technikwissenschaften. Um, welcome, Martina. We have on board Eric Fischer, an associate professor at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Um, and Eric is uh, the director of there of the Center of Responsible Innovation, and he is the editor in chief of the Journal of Responsible Innovation. Welcome, Eric. With us today, too, is April Tesh. April is an international law lawyer working at UNESCO, the United Nations Educational Certificate and Cultural Organization, and notably currently on the program on the recommendations on scientific and scientific, science and scientific researches, and working on recommendations for oversight of implementation, development, capacity building programming, as well as being on the editorial board of UNESCO Science Reporting which is very relevant also in light of RI. Welcome, Tesh. And then with us is René von Schomburg. René is the first editor of a milestone book of 19, 2019, um, comprehensively depicting the state of the art of RI, the International Handbook on Responsible Innovation, a global resource 
which captures what is currently a 2019 the state of the art of RI, a development also captured in the book of which he was among the founding fathers or parents, I should say, um, which he helped institutionalize is this sort of aff affiliation with the European Commission and about which he has consistently been publishing in um, very recommendable um, uh, articles and books and also in his blog post, which uh, blog, which I want to mention. Um, welcome, Renee. Then we have with us, I hope, if she's here, Fern Wixon. Great. Hey, Fern, I can see you. Sorry. Good to have you here. Fern is a transdisciplinary ecologist, currently working in, uh, at the Scientific Secretary of the North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission, which is um, and a commission working on the conservation um, and management of whales and seals in the North Atlantic. And previously, you worked as a research professor of environmental governance, specializing in emerging technologies, biotechnologies, nanotechnologies, which took her to exploring RI and contributing notably to the development of the concept. Um, she's among the editors of the Journal of Responsible Innovation, and you have she's been involved in work done on RI in the Research Council of Norway. Welcome, Fern. And then we have with us Erik Griesler, who is the head of the Technoscience and Societal Transformation Research Group at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Vienna, Austria. A sociologist and historian by training, he focuses on science society relations, which led him to focus on technology assessment, on ELSA, public engagement, and in line with that on RI. And currently, importantly, he's the coordinator of the New Horizon project and the main driving force together with his team behind current conference. So great to have you all on board. Now the current conference was spread out due to Corona sometimes good things come from bad things over two weeks which allowed a large number of people to join in uh, for um, sessions of an hour and a half at a time and which has therefore a very rich upshot now shona stack in the ihs team has prepared a mirror board where we can see the upshot of the rich discussions. As I said, I can't do them justice, but I want you to walk, to walk with me through what has been shared. Now here you see the program, which was a very rich and extensive, and we've been touching, because of this format, on many aspects of uh, RI. Now, when we started off in the first day, the key question was, what can we learn? Somebody raised this in the audience, the main lessons from the horizon and I would say other SWAFs projects experiences about mainstreaming RI. Well, that was exactly what Lyndon Farrer's opening address was about, who related how the implementation of RI over the past years um, by the efforts of SWAFs has taken place. And um, one of the key uh, conclusions was that the monitoring, the consistent monitoring of RI efforts by whichever name it goes, particularly citizen engagement is uh, very important for its future. Now on day two we focused on public engagement, the citizen engagement, and we could draw lessons in the opening session of the day on how to engage the public. And one of the lessons was it's very important to engage citizens by taking their problem perceptions, their life world as an entry point, uh, which is the main message from New Horizon. And then later on that day, we discussed the many tools, four of them particularly, um, which have been developed in New Horizons context to engage with citizens. On the third day, we discussed how RI is related to long-term societal change, a, th a theme that came about uh, came up also in, in further sessions. Um, and one of the conclusions 
was, and again, I won't do it justice, but was that RI is about the process, whereas the SDGs or the missions center around content. And so you could say, well, there is a perfect match, but there was somebody, and there was a lot of discussion, how if RI is about engaging citizens and it's about the content, then there might be a problem with the interest of our current generation and that of future generations, which I thought was a remarkably relevant point that I took out of this meeting. We moved on on the fall to think about these long-term transformative changes and the question on how RI can be a transformative force. Um, and again, the point that Farrell made uh, was made notably that it is important to keep track of um, the impact of RI informed efforts. Now, going on today, on the day five, we spoke about what does this mean for various domains? For instance, in business, one of the upshots, one of the insights from uh, the discussions uh, about RI in the business sector is that it does actually contribute to companies' competitive advantage. And therefore, it's attractive for companies to engage this RI. Um, of course, much more can be said about it. Same holds for research. And one of these, but one only, was that a very shared view is that the concept of excellence in research needs opening up, needs redefinition. Now, what does this mean? On day six, we spoke about implications and about how, notably in the light of ethics. And what came out was that ethics in R and I, in research and in innovation, is in need of a redefinition and particularly in need of a better integration, not as an add on, but as a quintessential part of designing innovation and designing research and of course implementing in, in innovation and in research. Um, another insight was that we cannot take the principles and understanding of what RI means for granted and this was particularly the upshot from bringing on board and, and we were happy to, to be able to do so partners from all over the world who questioned what we, and I speak for myself now, being based in Amsterdam as Europeans might consider obvious, right? And that a dialogue is crucial for a mutual understanding of what responsibility in research and in innovation might actually mean. And so moving on to the seventh day, we had discussions on how RI actually means, and this is in light of what I just said, a repoliticizing of research and of innovation. So it's moving away from a technocratic approach wherever still in place, whether it's um, evaluation and impact assessment or the design, and to really think what does this mean for those implicated and those potentially involved. Um, and also what does it mean for the organizations who should be able to work with that? And we spoke about the relation between RI and the learning organizations, concluding that RI requires, but also enables organizations to actually learn. And then on the eighth day, yesterday we spoke about the role of funding organizations in integrating RI in business innovation and research. And we spoke about the necessity to enable learning on the topic and therefore the need to invest in networks of RI-oriented actors. And I use this occasion to draw your attention to New Horizons Ambassador Program on LinkedIn. We hope to sustain a community of people who are RI-oriented in every walk of life. And which then brings us to where we are now. You are here. I want to open the floor to our panelists. And just taking a deep breath, see you all here. 
And I would love to invite Martina um, as the first speaker to make your opening address. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anne, for this wonderful journey through the whole conference. That's great. <laughs> and uh, I, I my, my, my most, my, my first sentence is, RRI is an increasingly important concept for shaping the future. And I think this is, this is shown uh, by this journey. And uh, I would like to explain it a little bit uh, in more detail. In Germany, we had the Forschungsgipfel last week in Berlin. The VW Strategic Innovation Officer, the KUKA Chief Innovation Officer, and the head of an NGO shared the opinion that research goals and innovation processes must be adapted to the needs and values of society. And uh, this was a very clear and obvious entrance statement of all three of them. And uh, this is really an increasing number of companies which are exploring that concept of RRI. But there are not only companies, but also ministries which are using this concept now. When you have a look on the web page of the German Wirtschaftsministerium, it's funding Real Labore, kind of social labs. Real Labore are test rooms for innovation and regulation. And uh, it's not only about testing, for example, digital innovations under real conditions, but also about gaining knowledge for the future of regulation. And especially in Hamburg, they are geared towards the common goods. For these processes in companies and also uh, in politics, the results of this New Horizon project and especially the thinking tool, I think, are very helpful. I understood during the session of this uh, thinking tool this morning that Real Labore address gate two and three in more technical projects and gate one in projects for planning and social sciences. And I think this is something uh, which would be also some, uh, a point we could work on later. I think there is a difference. So I have another point about the gender dimension, which is integrated into uh, research now even more than before, because the DFG, the German funding organization, has this new Codex for Gutes Wissenschaftliches Arbeiten, Good Practice. There is uh, paragraph nine demanding that you have to take into account the effects on different groups of the society. And I think this is really a wonderful starting point. And at the Gender Summit, which took place, I think, in April, uh, yeah, this year in, at, mu at video conference, at video <laughs> conference it should hit, take place in munich um, it became obvious that uh, also the editors of the big journals will ask for more discussion of this uh, gender aspects but not only gender aspects and this happens in the shed or in the light of uh, corona because only then when you really clearly describe for which group of society these effects are true. Uh, you can use them for political advice. And this is a really driving force. So I think this is also a lesson which can be used for going on with RRI. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. So there's many developments which, which are stemming hopeful, which is great. Thank you. Um, I would like to give the floor to Eric Fischer. Thank you, Martina. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, so I think that uh, it's a wonderful um, opportunity that we have to both look back over the last two weeks. Um, and the Mirror Board is, really does a wonderful job of summarizing many of the, the sort of high points, but also look back over the, the last 10 years or so. Um, but for what purpose? For the purpose of moving forward, of looking forward. And, and this, of course, is the purpose of the question. What, how can we move forward with RRI in a meaningful manner 
and I think in an institutionalized manner. But we live in interesting times. We live in interesting times. And so we need an RRI for our times. And what does that mean? Well, you know, um, we can take stock of where we are. We have to do this before moving forward. Um, but taking stock both internally in terms of the RRI movement, uh, the scientific and intellectual movement, as my colleagues have called it, but also more broadly in terms of the context in which it's operating. And just to cut to the chase, RRI really, in my mind, is about the normative and democratic governance of science and technology. And it's in a long history of such movements that attempt to strengthen the normative and democratic governance of science and technology. And I think it's very distinct at this point, um, very um, impressive what, what has happened. And it's, it's, it's not really any one person's uh, uh, you know, claim, but it's really a collective effort, uh, the work of many people working in tandem, some of whom have never met one another. Um, so it's really an impressive phenomenon. I think we need to pause and, and, and behold this thing. Uh, but at the same time, um, in taking stock, yes, RRI has meant and continues to mean many things. Yes, it's got a long history. Uh, yes, there was a recent surge of investments, but there was also a drop in that surge of investments. And yet, meanwhile, what has continued, the momentum has continued, the deepening has continued, the exploration into different facets of society has continued. None of this was scripted. It's fascinating to think about the sort of ways in which um, public engagement and what I call expert engagement working in, in laboratories and firms, both of, of these have evolved uh, really to the point where we can, we can talk about more and more firms taking this up and you know standards and whatnot. Um, so it's very interesting, this process. Um, and I think what's, what's most interesting is to look at the actual practices and examples, the tools, the methods, the cases, uh, and the particular uptake. Um, and I think you'll find that it's not simply um, greenwashing or responsibility washing, um, which one would expect uh, in a sort of routine process of institutionalization or mainstreaming. But instead, I think there's a lot of scrappiness, for lack of a better word. There's a lot of the Socratic gadfly questioning, um, keeping values on the table, uh, but at the same time, very importantly, a, um, uh, uh, a focus on uh, pragmatics and moving forward and having an impact. Um, changing the practices, whether at the you know at the macro level or micro level, um, having uh, this contribution to knowledge production. So this is very interesting. It's as though it's built in that there will be a transformative change, but that change is can be incremental and doesn't have to be radical. Now this leads me to sort of my my last point, which is the larger context and the interesting times in which we live. We live in a time of great unrest. It's perhaps less great than it was six months ago on January 6th in my country, um, but it's still the potential for incredible unrest, polarization, politicization, and anti-democratic developments, which we've seen all around the world, uh, uh, with apologies starting in my country and giving a basic license to other countries to do the same thing, making it sort of safe to be uh, anti-democratic. But of course, where did these things come from? They played upon grievances that members of the population have. And then, you know, this sort of becomes a coalition in itself. So we can't simply blame power and money and, and people who have, you know, strong, loud voices. This is a cop out. We really have to see that on some level, you know, there's a great amount of the population that disagrees with what many of us would say are the important things for society to accomplish in the next five to 10 years. And if we keep our heads in the sand and forget about this, we're being naive at best. Um, and if we decide that's okay, we're gonna fight it. Well, this is one version of RRI, is to politicize RRI and to add to the politicization. Now, I, I find it very difficult to say this because one of the beautiful things at the beginning of RRI was politicizing science agendas, politicizing research decisions. 
And this was indeed possible in the early 2000s, and it was a good strategy. However, I hesitate to recommend it in the course of the next two to three years. Why? Well, because we could lose the very ability to, dem to govern democratically. I think the ultimate goal is to keep the conditions for democratic governance alive, as Bob Marley would say, so that we can fight another day. And I realize that there are pressing existential threats. However, it's foolish to imagine that the best way to fight that threat is to put something in place which is partisan and which next year could just be turned over again. What we need is something stable, which means building a base upon which you can have more ambitious advances. So I think we really need to build the center. So I think RRI having many voices, having many theories, having both theory and practice, having a broad coalition appealing to multiple views, multiple sectors, all of these things which we have done or which has happened. Um, uh, so really at this point, I think disseminating best practices and continuing to move forward in a conscious manner, knowing that there's less of a sort of institutional cover from the European Commission, and there's more of a gra grassroots uh, movement and, and momentum, understanding the limits and the strengths of what we have, and uh, on some level continuing. But really, um, you know, I, know, I know it's provocative, but I think that we should not politicize um, the kinds of things that, um, that need to be politicized because yeah, the, the risk is too great. Thank you, uh, Eric. This is a very provocative statement indeed. Uh, thank you for positioning RI with this um, uh, call in the broader history and juxtaposing the history of democrat democratization of science and technology in light of the current anti-democratic dynamics. It's, it's a very um, thought-provoking statement. Thank you. Um, we'll continue uh, with the opening statement, we could no doubt get back on this and on what Martina said with, I would like to give the floor the statement of Fern. Thank you Anna and hello to everyone, lovely to see you all virtually and to have this opportunity to, to take up the question of the future of RRI. And it's been fantastic to see how the project has played out over the last two weeks. So thanks for holding such a wonderful final conference, very informative. In reflecting on the future, I, I find it um, challenging without a particular time horizon. Are we talking about a future in five years or a future in 500 years? Um, because it makes quite a significant difference. When I think about the future in five years, I hear people expressing um, some level of concern, perhaps, that, that the concept of RRI is disappearing, for example, from um, the Horizon Europe program. But of course, the disappearance of the concept of something specific in a 500 year horizon might be exactly what we're looking for. We want to alter the, the norms, the cultures, the institutional arrangements to such an extent that, that we don't need to talk about RRI as, as a specific and I, as identifiable thing because it's so integrated, it's led to such deep cultural change that that is just the way we do research and innovation. So of course, I think the time horizon on the future makes a difference for how we think and how we talk about it. But one of the things that I would love to see for the future of RRI is a much tighter link to the struggle of sustainability. And this means getting away from, from a purely kind of principle-based approach or a, looking at dimensions and, and really emphasizing the mission-oriented kind of flavor of RRI that has been a little bit in and out of its identity um, amongst different circles. And I think um, in that, that desire I have that the future of RRI is more tightly and explicitly connected to sustainability, I think I want to pick up on Eric's idea of the context that we're in. And Eric talked a lot about kind of the social context we're in, and I would bring into the conversation the ecological context that we're in. And it's not only interesting and unstable times. I mean, we are, to say it very directly, we're living in the sixth mass extinction. I mean, take that seriously. <laughs> that means we're losing species every day and our last assessment is set up to a million species are at risk. We've got a pollution crisis on this planet and that is not only plastic pollution 
in the sense of macro, micro and nanoplastics with more plastic in the ocean than fish in 2050. Take that seriously. We have heavy metal pollution. We have um, persistent organic pollution. We are toxifying this planet at incredible rates. And that's not to mention, of course, the climate crisis. We have this triple crisis of climate pollution and biodiversity loss that are undermining the ability of humans to persist and survive on this planet, let alone have democratic governance of research and innovation. It's our very survival that we're talking about. And so to be able to talk in terms of responsible research and innovation without talking about the role that research and innovation has in helping us with the, the quest for sustainability, the quest for our continued survival. I think we need a much closer relationship between those two concepts. Uh, in, if the future of responsible research and innovation is going to be meaningful, at least for someone like me. I also think that we've talked a lot about um, responsible innovation in terms of the science society relationship. And I think aligned with what I'm calling for in terms of our, our, a, a closer marriage with sustainability, I think you know, we need to look at innovation and environment relationships closer. You know, typically we're in the problems that we're in because of um, technology and what technology has enabled humanity to do. So we need to take seriously the relationship and reimagining the relationship between innovation and ecosystems. Um, and of course, we need innovation to get ourselves out of the the disaster we've created in our triple crisis. So there's exciting opportunities there, but I would love to see the future of RRI embrace uh, sustainability and, and actively engage with the mission orientation. But of course that requires an opening up for nuanced concepts of research. Not all research, for example, may need to have the same um, requirements for RRI. Things like we need to reconsider again the basic applied domains and whether we can talk about RRI as something in a more nuanced and divided way than simply applying to everything. Um, and thanks for giving me the floor to, to stand and preach for five minutes. I well, thank it. you, Fern, for this very important message and for drawing our attention to widening our scope from, say, science society relations and the societal context in which we do science and research, uh, sorry, research and innovation, to the relation innovation and environment. I think that's great. When you're plea for a less procedural understanding of our I am quite sure we'll talk about later uh, this afternoon and to take on board the temporal aspects of what it is we do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to give the floor now to Rene von Schomberg. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Anna. Um, yes, well, uh, thanks for giving me this uh, opportunity to um, to talk a little bit about the future of RRI. I think it's uh, it's a good moment uh, to do so. In fact, um, I, I believe that uh, in some sense, I'm probably much more a radical uh, RRI proponent than uh, most of you. Um, this, uh, I, I, I'll say that with the purpose on the content, what I'm, I will do in a few, 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 four or five points. I think, you know, first of all, your project had a difficult task. I mean, you wanted to mainstream something which was not yet institutionalized. Some were even working on indicators uh, uh, where there was no institutionalization of RRI. And going back in history, uh, I conceived myself, at least, uh, RRI as a social innovation itself, which requires institutionalization prior to, uh, before you can think of uh, mainstreaming and working on indicators and so on. Um, but this means indeed it's a social political contract uh, project in a certain sense. But as in my definition of RRI, which has a strong element of mutual responsiveness of uh, knowledge actors, it's around uh, creating a social commitment and giving the research a direction. And this is what I'm missing now. I mean, it's all we, what we have to do is driving research and innovation towards social desirable goals. And we can only do that if there are, for example, social commitments and legal frameworks to do so. Now, with the Green Deal, for example, it's maybe a weak version, but it's a version of something like that. Uh, and this will progressively lead to the opportunity also for civil society organizations 
to um, to go to court if we don't deliver. And this is now already happening in climate change. And this is the type of things I was anticipating 10 years ago. I was hoping this would happen and, and it happened. Um, so it, 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 it needs a strong uh, institutionalization and um, in a certain way, uh, some of our projects unfortunately um, work, let's say they put the carrot for the horse um, and I've been working on the horse, partly there was no horse, that's the institutionalization. And what does this institutionalization now entail? Well, first of all, we have to change the whole system of how we fund and do research. I mean, this is sounds very radical, but it's simply like that. Um, it, funding will need to change, and we do that uh, just responding to your excellence criterion. Of course, this is a red herring for an RRIist. I mean, the excellence criterion is terrible uh, if you want to do RRI, and this is why we change it. I mean, now on the horizon Europe, um, open science, and that means not open science and just producing open outputs, but also including um, societal knowledge actors as part of your project will be a rewarding element. It's an extension of the excellence criterion. So that's one element of institutional change. Still not sufficient in my view, but this is where we go. It has to be broader. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm against, uh, you know, in association to this, uh, when it comes to responsible research assessment and creating a new rewards and incentive system for research and, 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 and um, rewards and incentive system for science, which is a part of the a new institutionalization process. We have to move away of rewarding researchers uh, for their research outputs in terms of numbers of publications and so on. I am against any form of quantitative metrics and this is also why we propose to change this uh, from, um, from um, rewarding researchers uh, in their outputs to rewarding their researchers in their behavior. And of course, like always in the world, uh, we need crises to move forward rather than good ideas. And uh, with COVID, this was a gift for open science and for RRI because suddenly everybody realized we won't get a vaccine if we don't dramatically change our system. So we did it. But then the question of course is, uh, do we only do it for emerging health issues or also for all SDCs? Now I have been arguing uh, what Fern actually uh, asked now for already for decades. We have to do open science to institutionalize it for all sustainable development goals. So open science has to be, I mean, open science now, yes, not in, in the radical sense, in the sense that we have to share knowledge and data prior to publication, not post-publication. So this will be uh, uh, one thing which we have worked on. Of course, uh, universities don't necessarily like this change, uh, but uh, uh, this is actually what is our vision, and you see now already a part of it reflecting in Horizon Europe. I think there is no other funding program in the world who actually does this now, reward this. Um, so that's one element. The other one is, of course, uh, the way we do research has to be radically changed. And I think it's much more, you still talk about public engagement. I mean, we have done public engagements in science and society actions, I think since the data was born. Um, we do now something more radical. It's about co-creation and co-design, involving actors actively in the research agendas itself. There will be an unprecedented amount of money to keep, to get citizens in, to precisely to do that, uh, and we have now also a new mechanism for because our old program, let's say Horizon 2020, from which you benefited, did not have a mechanism. And this is what, what I say is the primary objective of RRI, and I missed this a little bit, to give direction to research and innovation. So why we don't have this mechanism? Well, this is because our political leaders didn't want to have such a mechanism. This was precisely the reason why I, in 2012, uh, left the RRI unit, where I first conceived this idea. And then the whole, I, whole uh, system started to regress to six keys, which is nice, but it's not RRI. Um, so now we do have a mechanism on the horizon Europe. Uh, and one of these mechanisms is the mission-oriented research. Uh, it's, it's not just um, missions in the terms of putting a man on the moon. No, it's a mission 
targeted to social objectives, not to technological objectives. And that means co-creation and co-design already in the research agenda with a commitment to source the goal. We have the Green Deal in terms already of legal requirements. We have to extend that to the open to the other sustainable development goals, of course. Some of the missions already reflect that. If they are successful, uh, I'm sure this will also happen. So it is very important that they will become successful. We are, of course, dependent, like always. You know, you can have a nice program with nice ideas, but uh, uh, they can bad projects can follow up from good ideas in the work program and vice versa. This we have to see, but I hope this will work. Mm -hmm. So finally, maybe as last point, I think RRI is not only about institutionalization and changing the institutional concept of research, uh, research funding and doing research, but also on the public governance of the economy. Uh, so we face a large market uh, failure in delivering on societal, social desirable objectives. Uh, you know, a vaccine would not have been produced if we don't publicly fund it. Um, and, and, and the same is true for malaria solutions. We have a huge market failure. Uh, in the All Sciences Society programs, very little STS people have ever paid attention to this. I think it's a disgrace. We should change this. We really have to uh, pull in uh, on, on address. It's a social political project again. Uh, about institutional exchange of, um, of pulling innovative actors in uh, with public money to give a commitment on those objectives which the market normally doesn't deliver. I mean, last 20 years, we didn't have seen any new antibiotic and we dra dramatically need one. This is the new COVID-19 is growing under us, uh, under our floor, uh, so to speak, but soon we will face it. So in conclusion, uh, we need a strong institutional change. We have been building on this. Horizon Europe shows already some of these uh, institutional uh, renewments. This is why I find it also a pity that something RRI has gone. No, RRI is stronger than ever before. We had only a cross-cutting issue. We now have it as a strategic objective. We have even legal obligations in the Green Deal. Um, maybe not always the word RRI is used, but so what? I mean, all the elements are there and um, otherwise you tell me what is missing. So, because I'm, I'm working here on it, so I need to know what is missing. So not what we already do better than you suggest, I want to know what we do wrong. Thanks. It's great, great to have this very thought-provoking statement. This is concrete list of, of, well, I would say a wish list, but we're working, of course, as a community already there, but you're quite right that the institutionalization of the legal framework of the reward system, etc., is indeed what it takes. Well, I'm, I'm confirming what you're saying, but of course it's up to the others, but I see uh, clashes and I see uh, overlap with, with previous statements and we have a uh, if we have the time, a beautiful discussion ahead of us. Uh, but first, I would love to give the floor now to April Tesh um, for your opening statement. What an honor to join this group. Thank you so much for the day and um, the two weeks of the conference. Um, as you introduced me, and I'll, I'll remind everyone, I'm a lawyer working in the UN system. And in the UN system, this perspective may be very different and unusual and uh, unfamiliar. So there are some things that I might need to make clear about how we work with the concepts. But clearly I'm, I'm a follower of what's going on in the European continent. And I see that um, this has developed from something of a movement into a much more organized conceptual framework. And it's really been defined, very well defined within the European region for some time. My interest is not um, uh, idle. I, I would say that the UN has to pick up on these ideas. And this has, I can inform today that this has already been done. And so in fact, while I've been working in the UN, the UN has created a sort of a treaty, um, not very familiar to most audiences, but this text exists. And it is for the purpose of keeping it possible to have a global science where the standards that are developed 
in the European U Union region are also recommended as the standards for every part of the world. Now, I say recommended lightly because, in fact, it's not really a recommendation, although that is the name in the title. This is an agreement between the governments where they have come to an agreement that these are the international standards for doing science in every region of the world. It exists since 2017. It does not use the words uh, responsible research and innovation. It does not use the same terminology, but we can read it and find that everything that we are looking for is actually in this text. The four years that it took to develop this um, agreement between governments involved quite a lot of discussion about how science can be responsible toward the environment because it was developed just in the same period as the SDGs and Agenda 2030. So while I think of RRI as a um, transformative agenda for how to do science, I also know in the back of my mind that there's a very strong agreement already in place between governments that says that they've agreed to it. And they've agreed to it not just for their own employees who are scientists, but they've agreed to it as a basis for writing new laws and standards in their own countries. So the follow-up to this text over the next 20 years, let's say, is really that I see demand in place in many countries outside of the European Union where they have signed up to these ideas in principle, but they are trying to work out how to make it happen, how to do it. And so just as the New Horizon project was doing the same kind of work from the ground up with many different techniques in the European region, I think that you'll see that there is now a, a growing demand because of this four year discussion in other countries and that at the level of the UN, which is really only a coordinator in this work, there will be some um, effort to have the conversations that go on in the European Union be in touch with those other countries that are looking to work out how they should, uh, starting from whatever point they are at, develop their future science in these directions with these practices. So. I don't have all the answers, but I can at least report that there is this existing text. There is going to be a second text, probably agreed by the end of this year, specific to open science. And as you know, the problems of having global science is all about crossing borders. So we also know that the resources for using and reading data with artificial intelligence tools are different from country to country, but if we want to have science collaboration across borders that works inside and outside of the European Union, we would like it to be on the basis of similar approaches, standards, practices, and access to not only data, but knowledge. So we, we will find in these initial texts some basis for working out what will be the future of the institutionalization of these concepts. And I think it's very, very fortunate that we had a, such a strong uh, voice for RRI in the European Union over these uh, long years, because now we're seeing the demand rise in other parts of the world. Another point on this, just to emphasize, it was agreed by 195 countries with no abstentions and in fact, fully agreed, that includes the US, and that, and that was before the US uh, removed itself from the conversation. But we have full agreement on this. And final point perhaps to make is that it's also been explicitly linked to a very strong set of conventions, which are called the Human Rights Conventions. So responsible research and innovation is now being defined in relationship, an explicit relationship to human rights, not just in terms of a right for scientists to freedom of expression, intellectual freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of association, etc., but also in terms of their responsibilities to society, in terms of certain ethics standards, and ethics um, practices and institutions for deliberative practices and integrating um, indigenous knowledge and other knowledge systems 
there's many aspects to this to be um, developed, could be discussed, but I would like to just point out that the human rights framework, because it's now been so strongly integrated, it's been recognized that RRI is a part of a um, understanding of the conventions that 170 countries of the world must, uh, uh, are obligated to follow up on in their laws. So there's a legal aspect to this that has been developing since 2017. And I would say that there's um, no sign of it stopping in the, next, in the future years. So I would say we have a good road ahead for all of these countries to be in, uh, in a position of demanding more, more understanding of the tools and mechanisms that they can use to actually achieve what they're aspiring to achieve, which is this larger concept of RRI. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, April, this very hopeful uh, uh, message that you have after a call for institutionalization of RRI and the elaboration of how you know, a social and ecological crisis and the crisis in democracy um, call for this. Um, this is really great. We'll, we'll continue because now we have a story about how on the global scale there is standards and practices. And there's a story about how this comes out in the actual practices of researchers, innovators, um, say citizens, etc. And how to combine them. That is still a challenge. I, s I first want to give the floor to Erich Griesler, finalizing this first round of opening statement. Yes, thank you very much, Anne. Um, I would like to be, I try to be rather brief. I hope I will succeed in that. I would like to start with uh, uh, recollecting uh, an interview with an uh, Austrian journalist uh, at the beginning of this conference, and he asked me, you heard so much about this responsible research generation in 2017 when this project started and now it's um it's it, you do not hear anything about it anymore and also if we look at horizon europe um you can only find the term responsible research and innovation once or twice in the text so what is it uh with a responsible research generation is it is it past is it is, is it gone is it history and that i answered um that I, from my perspective, um, uh, the glass is half full or half empty, uh, as you would like to look at it. And uh, I would like to explain this statement of mine a little bit. Just taking uh, our own conference, our own project, uh, the New Horizon project as an example, uh, which is one of many, many, many projects which have been uh, funded by the European Commission within the SWOFTS program. So if you look at, at New Horizon, what you can see is that there are, we have the instruments, we have the tools, we have the tools and toolbox uh, for re doing responsible use and innovation. I just want to, uh, to mention that we, in this New Horizon project, we generated uh, 61 pilot actions, which are showed on different levels for different stakeholders, for different purposes, for different keys, how to do, uh, uh, responsible research and innovation. So there is, uh, we know uh, how to do it. And uh, we constantly, um, uh, Shona and I and others, we constantly recounted how many pilot actions do we have because constantly new pilot actions came. Uh, so there, are, there is this toolbox is there. It's, uh, it's available. We created this virtual museum, uh, the RIX, where people can go visit and can have a look at the tools. So the tools, they are available. And also the communities there. I mean, if I look at these conferences, at these conferences, we tried to make this conference easy to use for people because of this um, Zoom fatigue that you are uh, staying in front of your computer all the day. And we uh, were kind of um, um, daring that we say, okay, let's do it for, uh, for 10 days and let's see what happens. And only two uh, sessions per day. And actually we have, uh, Helmut informed me right now, we had 825 visitors, participants. So uh, I don't know, maybe it's a, 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 a persistent crowd, maybe of 10, or it's a, a very large crowd, I don't know. But 825 people came and wanted to watch, watch that, what we had to say. And so there's a community there. There's a community there. There are instruments there, there are tools there. So we want, uh, that's the half, uh, the food that is, uh, the glass that is half full. But I also want to share with you uh, a slide, and I hope this works. 
Um, a slide that Michalis Tsatsani showed us during his presentation in, in one of the uh, sessions of the conference. And, um, and also Linton Farah gave us in his keynote lecture uh, a similar picture. So if you look at uh, RI in the context of uh, Horizon 2020, so the projects uh, science with and for society uh, were uh, 232 projects were funded, which is 0.66% uh, of all the funded projects, which were th uh, more than 30,000. Which this is not this, uh, this is not worrying. What, what what is worrying me is RI, and that's the last point here. RI was flagged as a cross-cutting issue in 4.4% of all topics. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, um, there are not so many uh, uh, projects uh, consider themselves or are considered by project officers as, uh, as RI projects. So that's uh, the reason why I think, uh, one of the reasons why I think that the, uh, the glass is still half empty. And there was another very interesting remark in one of our sessions by Elie-Marie Forsberg, who uh, talked about institutional change. And she said, well, um, she, she distinguished between incremental change and revolutionary change. And, and she said, well, change is very hard because people don't want to change the way they do things. Um, and I think that's the reason why we have to uh, be more persistent. And I think the future of our eyes dependent on how can we get out from this 4.4% of projects doing our eye. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I very much like what has been said so far. I mean, I didn't like it because it is rather a bleak picture from uh, uh, painted um, and also Eric said we're living in interesting times, but that's a Chinese curse. Uh, actually, people don't want to live in interesting times. Um, so I think I agree with Rene and Martina, Fern, and Eric that um, RI is somehow happening, and um, that values and needs of society, as Martina pointed out, are are important in research and innovation. But I think it's not only the goals that matters, it's also the way how we get there and the process is how we get there. And therefore we have to change um, uh, the way how we do research and innovation. It has to become more contextual, holistic uh, and dialogical. And that's the difficult part because we are, uh, we are going against the grain how science and innovation is done. And that's, that's the hard thing to do. So I think, the tools are there, the community is there. is there. We have to change things, but uh, this, makes a, it, this is an effort. And the question is, how can we do this? And uh, I would like to address this in my second, if there is time for a second, <laughs> for my second part. It's, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Eric, for actually putting the finger on the sore spot, right? So indeed, it's true. I mean, and amongst the, the, the lot of you, that it's clear we have a vibrant community of people, whatever the label they use, with a similar mindset, or at least sharing the um, the intention of addressing this. And we have a whole set of toolbox, you know, um, gadgets and tools and ideas, and everything is there. And we have a clear view of the challenges ahead, or at least our speakers just shared where the challenges are and how to bring them together. Now, I would love to, indeed time is an issue, but I still would love to see whether there's people in our midst who want to comment, reflect, maybe we have time for one or two, Shona, and then uh, to take this opportunity to have all these people here, here in our panel who are so, um, well, experienced in, in addressing the questions that are now on the table, I would love to hear you uh, reflect on each other's positions and statements. Uh, among them, I would say the, well, the, the chicken and egg thing of institutionalization of standards and of the practices that we've been talking about and the um, double-edged sword of keeping what's there and not politicizing beyond where we are now because we need a stable basis, whereas we have radical issues on our agenda, right? So there is, for me, at least two 
main questions here. Shona, are there people from the audience or the wider community want to chip in? Uh, so far, I, I see one comment, but it was rather uh, a comment of support, not necessarily uh, a question. Okay. So nobody's speaking up. Uh, Lyndon is raising his hand. Oh yeah, Lyndon, please go ahead. Take yes, the hello. Nice to be um, <coughs> with you again uh, for this final uh, part of the, uh, the conference. I've been enjoying going through the, um, the museum, the virtual museum. I haven't seen that done before. Um, j just to provide uh, just a bit more clarification, perhaps, on the topic flagging, because this is brought up earlier in the week by uh, Michael, who thought did a good, very good job of, of showing how attention to the dimensions of IRI, which uh, of course creates some debate in itself, um, are really being stepped up in Horizon Europe. So I think that was quite an interesting point that he made. Um, but in addition, this topic flagging is a bit problematic because it was introduced uh, at our request in 2017. I'm not quite sure how the figures uh, have been calculated. Um, I guess it's from NCP work, but I, I'm not sure. But in any case, there wasn't any topic flagging for RRI before then. Uh, and there's, I, I think the point um, that there's a lack of awareness within the institution of what RRI meant is well-founded, in fact, and, and it probably does reflect uh, the low level. But um, if I refer back to a slide that I made um, earlier this week, I think it was, uh, well, I can't remember exactly when, but uh, whenever I made it, about the number of topics that we expect or recommend um, to see uh, engagement activities take place, it's close to 27% of the topics in the clusters. Um, now, it's not just about co-creation uh, with citizens, it's, it's all sorts of different activities, uh, multi-stakeholder approaches, co-design, reflection on technologies and things like this, but I, I really think that this plays into what rene has been saying in terms of this stepping up of attention uh, to these forms uh, of research and innovation. Anyway, just a bit of a clarification and also congratulations to the entire team on a very good uh, stimulating conference. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon. That was uh, nice to hear. And, and yeah, and I think what I take from what you're saying is that it's also a matter of, and that came up, of course, in every contribution just now, of how to call it, right? And RI might be the label as a, a, a way forward, uh, whereas to, for a broader development, whatever we want to call it, um, and so, depending on how you call it, the flagging is, 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 is you know, it's a mixed bag of what you see. Um, how will we proceed? I, I think, with all the provocative statements made, for me at least, what stands out is this, well, you can't see my hands, uh, you know, the idea of institutionalization and with April's contribution, say, the global level or we have the EU level, and then we have at the level of institutions and in uh, Martina's uh, contribution about how this is on the, the German national scale or in companies, you know, um, and multinationals on the one hand. And on the other hand, there is this call, and I think um, uh, René brought it out, that the quintessence for him at least of RI, and I think we many of us share this, is the mutual responsiveness. And he said, well, that is what this misses now. And it's sort of on the personal level, but pe people, of course, are professionally embedded in this context. So how, what do we take from the past experiences? As Erich pointed out, there is this uh, whole set of experiences and it's in the exhibition and it's in the narratives and it's in the RI practice project toolbox. And well, there's many of them. How can we use those to somehow bridge the gap between this high over ideas, institutionalization, and the actual practice. Who can I give the floor to? And, and please, then others feel free to comment. And we have like about 20 minutes, so we won't make, well, we'll never come to an end of this conversation, but yeah, please go ahead. Eric, Eric, I so just want I just want to reflect back uh, what you said on Anna and um, Anne and put it into just the sort of visual context of three domains, right? To sort of representing what the panelists have come up with. I, I think the three domains are the sort of, um, you know, for lack of a better word, the, the limitation or the constraint 
of over politicizing and losing a democratic base and having totalitarian governments everywhere that will just ruin the planet quicker than you can imagine. On the one hand, the extreme urgency of taking care of the planet and societies and democratic governments and the base that April, Renee and Eric all talked about, the strategic, legal, uh, an infrastructural base that has been built up. So I think these are the three uh, criteria <laughs> or constraints that we can operate within in our discussion. That's very clear. Anne, am I correct that you want to chip in? Um, yeah, well, maybe uh, shortly. Uh, so so I, I think, uh, I, I think RRI will, um, will be implemented, uh, you know, also uh, field uh, specific, but I think uh, notably in context of, of, of mission oriented research uh, actions, um, and then around, uh, around either uh, more open collaboration within science itself, depending on the type of the mission, when it's more, more uh, uh, frontier science type of research, or with, uh, with societal actors. Uh, uh, so, in terms of uh, multi multi actors uh, approach, for which there are all kinds of new governance models uh, floating around, which uh, which are useful. So, it's in in the end all about constructing a a, a good governance of research and innovation. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, really on uh, directing research and innovation towards the social desirable ends. The SDGs are uh, well anchored in uh, Horizon Europe now. I think it it, it uh, runs up to almost 50% of the total world budget. So in theory, uh, you could have 50 billion euro uh, for the next seven years on RRI. Uh, if, if, if one would do it properly, then uh, this would happen. But this is all dependent on how many intelligent people in the research community will, will apply for it. Yeah. So, uh, so this is not in our hands, but uh, th this is uh, something which has to come from the research community itself, and and this this in itself also requires a different research culture. So, uh, this uh, you already see it only on the level of open science. It requires uh, a transformation of research culture, which in uh, some areas of, of sciences uh, works, like the environmental sciences. But in a lot of scientists, uh, science areas, it, it doesn't work very well. We still have to make progress there. I think that's exactly a topic that's now on the table between what Eric shared and what you're saying. And I heard it, uh, Fern say too in her opening statement, the need to have this infrastructure in place and reward system, etc. But then there is also the need to make it field specific. That was your call. I don't know if Fern is, if that's what you want to respond. I actually just want to praise the project a little bit, which I'm sure I'm allowed to do. Um, but I think that when we're looking at, okay, how do we work on an institutional level and a global level and also a personal um, research behavior level, I think what was fantastic looking at the pilot actions that emerged from the New Horizon project is that they spanned different levels. That when you got a diverse group together and you encourage them from the ground up to come up with pilot actions, they were naturally targeting and operating at different levels. And I think that the, the thing that I take away from what New Horizon has offered this field is the action based approach, it's the pilot actions, it's the experimental work, it's do things small scale and adapt and the feedback loops. But try things out, adapt, experiment, and don't wait to take action. And I think that the range and the breadth and diversity of the pilot actions that the project managed to mobilize is, is just highlighting that we can have action across various levels happening simultaneously, and that can, that can actually emerge from, from facilitating a ground up kind of approach. And so I think the project's done a really important piece of work to show the importance of, um, of taking action, of doing it experimentally, of doing it reflectively and adaptively, and that, that that will naturally touch on various levels and that's possible to do all of them at the same time and that's important to do all of them at the same time. That's, that's great to hear. And it's also, I think, exactly an answer 
and it's what we explored in the Horizon project, but I guess it's the way forward of indeed dealing with this, well, this puzzle of indeed working on a global level, institutional level and a personal level. Um, how does that play out, for instance, in your story, Martina, where you brought to our attention what's happening currently in these agreements among firms, agreements among um, ministries, etc., which is a uh, dynamics towards uh, institutionalization, does it leave open the room to, uh, well, have field specific and institution specific interpretations? I think it's very interesting that the SDGs um, are now really, uh, yeah a set of, uh, of goals which are uh, yeah uh, which are true for every ministry in Germany they have to show every year how far they are with reaching the goals uh, of the SDGs the problem is uh, for uh, in my opinion <laughs> When you have the Ministry for Environment, for example, they are doing quite a lot of uh, uh, involvement or actions to get information and ideas from, from society. And you have, on the other hand, the Ministry for Research, for example, which don't want to take that. And this mutual responsiveness I'm not sure who mentioned that wording. I think this is something which is the next step and really important between the ministries and then the, in the next step, it's important for the whole funding situation, also for the, for the research. The companies, there is something different uh, in place. It's, it's really interesting because the sustainability funds are growing, so money is given according to the SDGs or, or ESG uh, criteria. And this is really the most driving force <laughs> when you have that in place. And uh, I've heard uh, a short uh, lecture from a lawyer who told that she is looking for criteria for the board members' salaries to measure the improvement according to the SDGs of a company. And that's a hard job. This is really hard to find good indicators. And uh, RRI, in my opinion, could be a step to come to that criteria. So, so I, yeah. seeing the whole innovation system as a quadruple helix, which is really interacting, then I think this is a great thing to Im implement RRI here. So, well, thank you. It's really, and I see many people nodding and, and, and just enthusiastically waving their hands, assuming that because of uh, endorsing your entry, it's like, uh, or your contribution, uh, where, it's, where it really plays out is on the level of individual institutes, companies, etc. We're working with the standards as set on the transnational global level as set, etc. May I, I don't know if, if I, want, I want to put you on the spot, but I see a Mr. Ben Cockler enthusiastically responding do you want to chip in or i will move on to asking uh april um how you think about this so you've been working on this global level um uh, standards and you mentioned the number of countries 194 by heart um who who endorsed this or 95 um and I can imagine how you would think hearing this story from Martina uh, about this thought that I have, I don't know about you, that it's always very easy to sort of agree on some nice long-term goals, which are noble and morally just, etc. cetera. But it, you know, when it comes to play out in practice, then the tension comes. And there is, of course, a conflict of interest among the groups that we just now all heaped together as endorsing these standards. Would you, is there anything in the New Horizon project that you could bring on board in dealing with such a puzzle? Perhaps I could just say that I, I 
completely understand Martina's comments and I was nodding my head because the the same thing goes on in different countries, but the contexts are very different. Something that Renee said is also of interest because when we are looking across so many different contexts in different countries, one of the major problems with anything to do with science is a very naive idea that it's a linear process that delivers something for society and that's been around for a long time so um the 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 challenge with the mission driven science is that it comes into contact with this very naive pre-existing belief that science somehow is supposed to deliver something to society and and so i do have a little bit of hesitation there because of the um repeated contacts with this um this naive belief in so many places obviously many parts of the world are not europe and they do not have strong science cultures and strong science history and and strong scientific communities but these weaker communities need just as much to have um a an open door they also don't have the um the funders as a channel for influencing their behaviors they're more likely to be influenced firstly by the change of laws um and that's where the commitment came in so perhaps i could just end by saying that the commitment with these 195 countries is actually not at a level of principles it's very specific they're obligating themselves to, um, for example, uh, address the appraisal systems and, and address the um, parental leave and all kinds of details are in this text. And so we're at the level of details, we're at the level of technical, legal details, changing laws in order to um, set minimum standards. But beyond that, the UN is not well placed to do the work which has to be bottom up. And I think that the New Horizon project demonstrates that very well. Having international agreements, uh, even at the EU level, where it might be working well through the funding mechanisms pushing a, a, a type of practice, there is still a lot of work to do um, to have people from the bottom up basically understanding their, um, their interests in line with this transformative agenda for science. I think we'll get there, but it's more likely in 40 years. Well, yeah, I see some endorsement in, in, in how people respond. Uh, of course, in the, in, the, in the broader context, and I think it was Fern who drew our attention to the temporal aspect, 40 years might be just a, a drop in the ocean, it's a, it's a very, a, a blink of the eye, but on the other hand, it's a lot of work ahead. Um, I, I thank you for reminding us, which is also indeed in the New Horizon project, thanks particularly to our overseas partners, among them Farsha Persaud, I don't think she's here, but she pointed out to us at some point, like, you know, this whole talk about open science, she's from the Caribbean, um, in our context, is is not ri it's about giving away you know what we can't patent and intellectual properties etc so this eurocentric bias and i'm also looking at myself that we have in thinking about ri is something we really should be um, aware of and i think with your unesco view uh that helps to broaden that which doesn't make the challenges ahead sorry about that um less uh, challenging um, now, looking at the time, um, I see there is some comments in the in the in the um, chat, which perhaps we can give the floor uh, first um, and or some attention, and then I would like to move back to Erich for you to combine perhaps your reflections on what we take from New Horizon in dealing with those challenges um, with what. I hope would be your closing statement, but we are not there yet. And I don't think we can address this in 10 minutes, but maybe people in the audience or in the community can, can contribute to that, Shona. 
Yes, so we have one question from Joshua. Uh, I can in invite Joshua to pose his question or I can read it. Joshua, go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. Thanks. Uh, so my video uh, is not working here with this connection, uh, but uh, just my question is, uh, how do the panelists uh, look at the possibilities for the RI community uh, to join more forces with other communities working on open science, citizen science, co-creation and co-design? Co and then I think especially for me, it's interesting uh, how, how they could join forces in the attempt to increase uh, what Eric named the democratic governance and democratic practices within the RI. RNI. I was really curious to hear a bit more about that from the panelists. Maybe too big of a question for the last seven minutes, but anyway. Wonderful question. Thank you, Joshua. Who would like to? Who would like to be the first? Um, yeah, I can respond if uh, if this is okay. Um, so I, I I think for the governance of of a responsible research and innovation, you have let's say multiple layers. One is the, the governance of, uh, for instance, the funding framework, where we have now some institutional uh, revolutions, if you wish, and then the governance of, of the, 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 the research itself, uh, or even when you have these complex research missions, which are uh, social objective driven rather than technology driven. Um, then when it comes to your question, I mean, I think in my view, um, open science should be part of any project. I mean, I mean now open science in its operational sense. That means that uh, two aspects, that is openness towards uh, knowledge sources, so working with open data and open, open uh, knowledge infrastructures, but also uh, openness to knowledge actors, so uh, within science and uh, beyond, uh, beyond science to so this is this is uh, what 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 is uh, the the engine so to speak uh, of 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 science, but then of course RRI is has a more ambitious requirements even than open science. So we, I think we will promote open science uh, at least uh, to the to the limits uh, uh, you know universities and research institutions allow us, but. Um, uh, error I is, is a stronger requirement and, and this is where I have to come back to, you know, my original vision uh, of uh, now more than 10 years ago uh, with this key element of mutual responsiveness of knowledge actors, which has to be institutionalized some way or another. And that means that public authorities have to step up either in legal requirements or assigning uh, responsibilities to actors. And I, I think uh, in Horizon Europe, we do have there also quite now some good futures because, you know, citizens are a part of the program, for example. I mean, in most national programs, they cannot be funded. If a citizen wants a research funding, they don't get it because they are not scientists, you know. So uh, this, is, this is an institutional uh, renewal again, you know. So we have to make it possible that actors who want to participate in uh, research and innovation uh, mm -hmm. also can do it. And, and become uh, so it's allowing and assigning responsibilities. So it's a, it's a way of organizing what I have called already in 2007, uh, organizing co-responsibility, and that has also multiple layers. It has also institutional things like uh, the implementation of the caution principle in law, which is also a driver for RRI indirectly. Yeah. And there are many many elements. So. Um, uh, it, well, one should not lose sight of them. I, I know that, uh, you know, when one does a project, one has a particular focus, but all these elements count and uh, this is all part of a framework. And it's, it's clear that you point out that it's individuals responsibility, but it's the systems or the say the institutions, um, well, that should sort of direct uh, the behavior towards those ends. Eric Fisher, you want to comment yeah i just wanted to make two points um one in response to joshua's question and one in response to renee's comments uh, so working backwards um yeah i think it's uh important to um to to recognize that that mutual responsibility and mutual responsiveness uh and co-responsibility these were from the beginning in rri and these are some of the things we want to take forward um and this but um there are different cultures and this goes back to this point of not taking things for granted right so i haven't talked much about it 
or you could say that it's all I talk about when I open my mouth, but the difference between U.S. and European outlooks is as, as different as it is similar. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? We can't assign responsibilities in my country. This is a non-starter. All you can do is create structures and incentives. Yes, you can have charismatic leadership. Yes, you can work uh, as a stealth or an open political agenda, uh, but you know, Obama moved in one direction, Trump moved, Trump moves in the other. This is right. So, so it's, you know, there are different political cultures. And of course we go to the Caribbean and then we have a different political. So, um, you know, um, having a pluralistic approach and recognizing that different legal and, and political approaches and cultural approaches are going to work at different levels at different times in different places is just simply we have to, you know, this is what it's, I think this is what globalization means, not having a top down structure that it's only a European vision or only a US free market vision or only a Chinese, you know, we're, we're gonna take care of the people vision. Um, the other point though is, is this idea of joining forces, which I think has to happen and is already happening. And it's more a question of how to happen and what are the, what are the considerations there? Um, because, you know, for instance, in the US right now, there's something called public interest technology, PIT. And uh, who knows how long this will last. And of course, it means many things to many people. But we have a program uh, at Arizona State University that looks mm -hmm. at the principles of public interest technology. And it builds on responsible innovation, but looks backward and looks forward. Um, yeah. So this is something to join up with. And I would just say that it's important in the process not to lose these wonderful principles that have built the foundation for us to exist and have this conference and have this conversation now. So the concepts, the principles, the things we've learned, the emphasis on learning, um, building capacity to act, building capacity to analyze. Um, these are the things that I think we need to focus on. How do we do that? Well, two suggestions. One is what's already come up is monitoring, not just monitoring RRI, but monitoring what counts, you know, what is RRI even by other names, RRI by other names, right? So we need to monitor this. And, and one way to do that, of course, is to use the scholarly uh, community and the scholarly institutions that we have to do so. So obviously the Journal of Responsible Innovation takes yeah. a very broad look at what counts as responsible innovation, whether it's that term or not. And so just really encouraging people whether it's in JRI or elsewhere, to have the theoretical and the scholarly component, this is part of the monitoring. That's great, yeah. And I think that's a very um, uh, urgent issue. Indeed, that's been discussed quite extensively in the New Horizon context, how to monitor in a way, you could say meaningful indicators or narratives to bring out what's really at stake and to keep open to this interpretive flexibility that Fern uh, addressed and the adaptiveness that is relevant in what, what René shared and still be able to keep track and particularly in the ways that uh, the science system and the science policy system is opening up to non-scientists and to citizens. Now with an eye on the time um, unless there are very uh, urgent, but there's people who feel the urgency to, to speak up. I think we are never done, but let us know now. I don't see any raised hands. I would like to give the floor to Erich Griesler as one of our panelists to comment on the, well, key themes that are on the table, but also to take this opportunity to speak some final, um, well, to make some final statements as well, by way of wrapping up this session in this conference. Eric, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, for the sake of brevity, I will just um, uh, point out what at this moment seems to me the, the greatest challenge and the greatest need that is really to work on the on on, on the shop floor level in, in projects and institutions that make RI happen. And I think that um, here intent transit this transdisciplinarity is key. So how can um, how can uh, researchers of different disciplines and uh, 
and uh, lay people, other stakeholders work together to create RI or to do research and innovation in an RI fashion. And I think there are a lot of, and I have to advertise naturally our project New Horizons, so there are a lot of seats uh, in the project. Um, just wanting to mention uh, a few uh, pilot actions like the Green Village Delft or a dustbin which has been developed in, in another uh, another pilot action, or the Quadrolog and nuclear dating, where uh, lay people and experts uh, try to dialogue together and come to solutions, but also uh, pilot actions which try to enrich funding mechanisms. I think all these tools are available and I really would uh, welcome you and uh, would like to encourage you to visit this RRIX, which uh, we created uh, in order to keep this uh, stuff, these instruments and tools available. Um, I think New Horizon was an extremely interesting project for me. It was the largest project as I've ever done. It was a long and it was an interesting journey, but it was also a very daring journey because we were never sure whether we would succeed or not. And I uh, hope uh, gladly we succeeded, or we think that we succeeded. Uh, it was extremely complex. We had these 19 social labs, and we had these 750 people who participated in these social labs. And there was always this challenge. Uh, we were always challenged, uh, on the one hand, this contextuality and the diversity that was needed in the different social labs, but also this need for a unified method in order to make uh, things comparable and to, to, uh, to, uh, to be clear that this is one project and one approach. Um, to show you we, how complex it was, we were never sure, as I already said, how many pilot actors we actually had, because um, people during the social labs came up with new ideas, new ideas, and told us only in, this, in the social lab workshop, actually, we did this and we did this and we developed this, um, uh, this pilot action. So we were, we are very happy that it came to a very good end from our perspective, and we hope that our results will be useful uh, that they don't stay only in a, in, on paper, but that they will be useful for other projects in the future, and we are going to work for it. We try to keep uh, the website up to date, and we try uh, we try to create uh, uh, a format uh, in which uh, people are invited to do other RI projects to join, and also can make use of uh, of, of our results. So with that, I want to thank uh, or come to the closing actually, and, and thank you all. I want to thank uh, these many visitors we had in this, uh, in this conference. It was really great uh, to have you here and it was, very, was a big support for us. I want to thank all the social lab participants. I already said we had 750 people who contributed to this project. I want to thank all the consortium partners. We had 19 uh, consortium partners, and I don't know how many people were, were working in the consortium partners. We lost kind of uh, oversight, not the oversight, but we lost uh, uh, the general picture, how many people are actually working there. I also want to thank the European Commission first of all for funding, but also for the, uh, the project officers we had. Uh, we had three of them, and all of them were extremely supportive and helpful. But there were also other uh, uh, people within the European Commission, like René or like Linden, who supported us, and there were others who supported us behind the, sea, uh, behind the curtain. I want to thank um, also uh, Shona Stack, Bia Weininger, Marie Suchonova, and Helmut Hönigmeier for making this conference possible without their energy and their uh, proactive attitude and their imagination and their hard work, this wouldn't have been possible. So thank you very much, uh, all of you. And now it's over. Thank you. <laughs>